Hey guys, just a quick note before we jump into this week's episode of InStride. InStride is brought to you by Ride IQ. Ride IQ is a mobile app with hundreds of on demand listen while you ride audio lessons, taught by eventing, jumper, and dressage coaches. In other words, with Ride IQ, you can take a lesson from an incredible coach during any ride you'd like. No hauling and no scheduling. Whether you're looking to add structure to your rides or try new exercises or build confidence, Ride IQ can help. Membership is only $29.99 per month, and every membership automatically includes a two week free trial. Try it for yourself today by downloading the Ride IQ mobile app on iPhone or Android. On today's episode of In Stride, Sinead is talking to Boyd Martin. Boyd grew up in Australia and began riding at a young age. He won his first CCI 5 star at the 2003 Australian International 3-day event, riding True Blue Tuzak. In 2007, Boyd moved to the US to be the assistant trainer to Olympian Philip Dutton for two years before starting his own business. Boyd began riding for the US in 2009. He's a three-time Olympian, representing the US in London in 2012, Rio de Janeiro in 2016, and Tokyo in 2020. He's also a three-time U.S. eventing team member for the FBI World Equestrian Games, and he was selected for the team again this year in 2022. A couple of Boyd's many successes include winning team and individual gold at the 2019 Pan Am Games with Tesserleg TSF, also known as Thomas, and being the USEF five-star national champion at the Kentucky three-day event, both in 2019 with Thomas and in 2021 with On Cue. Boyd and his wife, Grand Prix dressage rider Silva Martin, own and operate their farm called Windura USA in Pennsylvania. Today, Boyd and Sinead are talking about his approach to striving for and accomplishing success at the highest level. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. We are joined by Boyd Martin, who it looks like you're just taking a break from teaching or riding, or you've just got this great backdrop and enjoying everybody else doing the horses while you're having a chat. <laughs> no, nah, to be honest, I was thinking about doing this in my house, but I got two kids in there and I've done these podcasts before. And before you know it, one of the kids is stealing your phone and someone's kicking the door down and then they're fighting each other. And so I, I snuck out to my jump ring and, uh, set my phone up out here mate yeah i know it's funny how that changes <laughs> I, i'm actually hiding <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know everybody's like how do you uh you know how do you have kids and work and do all of that i'm like i love working like get me yeah. into the ring get me to the barn the kids are <laughs> exhausting well um big congratulations on being named to the squad for the world championships that's very exciting stuff um, it's got to be kind of a, is it still, I mean, this is a dumb question, but does it, is it still feel stressful leading up to that announcement? I mean, you've been like a regular on pretty much every team thus far, but is it, do you still kind of get those nerves before you get the call or the email? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a, you know, I've been at it so long and um, to be honest, looking back at my career, like I tried to get on so many teams when I was in Australia and, you know, there was a couple Olympic teams or WEG teams that I, I just missed out on. And, you know, initially I never thought it was going to happen. And then um, to, in 2010, I uh, got my first chance to compete at the World Equestrian Games for America. And I mean, that was uh, just, uh, I'll never forget how nervous I was and um, you know, it, it was di so different back in those days. They used to sort of bring all the riders into a huddle and, and uh, it was it was horrible, you know. And the, uh, the I remember Mike Huber was the, um, I think he was the chairman of selectors. And, you know, you you have 10 people that have sort of moved their whole life to get on a team. And they and he, he had this speech where everyone's tried so hard and the, it was a tough decision, but the team is this, 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 and this. And, um I mean, it was a, it was tor torment, you know, just wondering if your name would get called out. So it's a little bit more humane now where they, um, they, uh, they send you an email or you get a phone call. And, um, you know, I thought uh, my horse, uh, Cessa Leg, uh, finished fourth at um, Kentucky three-day event and went to the Olympics last year. And, and he, he's a pretty sound horse. So I, I sort of, I thought I was in with a good shot, but you, you know, you just never know. And especially this year, like I think there was so many horses at about the same, same score. Like my fellow um, 
he didn't actually have a great finishing score at Kentucky. He finished fourth. Um, he had two rails down. So there was actually a few reasons not to get picked this year. But then the, a lot of the other horses weren't so good at the dressage, but great cross country and show jumping. Then there were some that were good at the dressage and show jumping, but a bit slow cross country. So there was, I don't know, in my book, there was about eight horses um, that I thought could get named to the squad of five. So um, I actually think for the first time in a long time the that people missed out that could have been on where usually it sort of picks itself. So, uh, you know, I thought, I thought I was in with a good shot and to answer your question, I was nervous as hell and, you know, mm-hmm. checking my emails every five minutes and, uh, you know, Bobby Costello called me and I thought, okay, you're going to tell me good news or bad news here, Bobby. <laughs> and uh, he burst into laughter and he said, no, you're, you're good to go. So it's a, a good relief, but, you know, not to ramble on too much. It's, you know, getting picked for a team's a huge sigh of relief, but it, it's also not the the main goal, you know. And um, I think so many times we all sort of focus getting getting to the show rather than than doing doing really really good in the moment at that competition. So it's sort of, you know, I've been at it for a while now, and uh, it's it's great to be named. But you know, we've got a serious mission ahead of us here, going to uh, to Italy. Yeah. How do you balance that? I mean, there's such a back and forth between, you know, setting performance-based goals and process-based goals. Where do you kind of, how do you, how do you wrestle between those two things and not get too much one way or the other? Um, To be honest, I've I've never, ever um, worried about making a team. Uh, Like, how do I say this? I, I think you can get so worked up about, getting on the team and my mindset's always been just I've got a top horse and I'm going to go as hard as I can at my main goal this spring's Kentucky and if he finishes well there and he's healthy uh, then I I should be good to go like I'd I'd never you know I think everyone gets so wound up about oh um, the team and where are we staying and what's the date of the competition and how the horse is getting there I mean I, I honestly don't wouldn't have even known what month of the year the WEG is, uh, if you really, if you honestly asked me in um, February or March this year, I, I couldn't have told you if it was in August, September or November. Um, I just had my, my sight set on doing really, really well at Kentucky. And, you know, that, that sort of theory s- served me well because I, I feel like, you know, making a team is just a, just a reflection of a, a, a consistent, good performance with a, a sound horse. And, and I don't know, I get a real kick out of the five stars and, yeah, I feel like if you do well at these big five stars, the international ones, then, uh, you know, the, the team come that, you know, getting selected for a squad or a team comes or a list or something like that gets, gets after, you know, gets picked after that. So I'm, I, I'm a bit removed from the team chatter, you know, until after the major, major events done. And then I sort of start thinking about that. So is there a shift now? That you've been named is there a change in the in the program a change in the uh the runway to patroni or is it still kind of business as usual you know i'd, I'd say that i i give my absolute best when i'm uh, getting ready for a five star and um you know to be honest this uh patoni is i treat it just like how i was going to burley or um maryland five star and uh get my my horse as fit as it, he can be and start working on the test and really focus then of the jumping and the cross country schooling and, you know, working out my preparation events of how I want to compete my horse there. And um, obviously, you know, you're not just doing it for yourself. You're on a, on a team and on a squad. So I suppose the big difference is that you, you know, there's a group of you sort of banded together going to this one major competition. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different than going to Burley or, or Maryland five star or Poe. It's a, you know, you, you sort of got to check in with the, the coaches and staff and, you know, a lot of it's easier actually. Like um, you don't have to worry about booking flights or hotel rooms or yeah. worrying about all that stuff and uh, that, that all gets taken care of. But, you know, there's a bit of added pressure, you know, the, um, the scrutiny on the horse's health is, is probably more dialed in and focused of the, the, the horses are getting trotted up and their, their soundness is getting checked over and over again. And, you know, there's there's always this thought in the back of your mind where if you if you have a 
blunder um, at the lead up event or you you go a bit sore or lame you you know you could could well be off the list to go to this championship so when you're just riding for yourself you can sort of put that aside and keep soldiering on so I suppose it's a, a little bit of added added pressure a little bit of a shift so I want to back up a little bit um, so your parents were both very athletic <laughs> A uh, uh, skier and um, speed skater, am I correct? Yeah, my mum was a 3,000 metre speed skater and my dad was, uh, he was in the cross country Nordic race, the 50 kilometres so, at so uh, 68 it, Olympics. So. What was it like in the Martin house as a, as a young chap, as a kid? Uh, you know, I probably had a different upbringing to most kids. Um, you know, sport was just a huge part of our family and you know, I had polar opposite parents. You know, my, my dad was a, he was a bit of a character and um, very determined guy, but very humble. And, um, you know, at school sports, he wasn't the, the parent on the sideline cheering and yelling at their kid, but he'd, you know, come up and shake your hand after a running race and pat you on the back and tell you top effort. And, and my mother was the opposite. She was, uh, you know, like she was just driven to win and, um, you know, like the placings were important and uh, results were important and, uh, six, you know, so it was a good a good mixture of both of, you know, of, of staying humble and calm and quiet, achieving quietly. And then the mother was, you know, that if you want to have fun, winning is the, the best amount of fun you can ever have. And, uh, um, you know, like from a, just from a young, young age, I, I just remember through school sports as a young kid of, running cross country and on the track and surf lifesaving and all sorts of sports. Um, you know, the, 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 the results were just so important to my mother. And then the old man was a bit the opposite where I think he was competitive as hell, but um, he uh, was a, not sort of the in your face type, type dad, but I don't know, was, was always there quietly. And uh, I suppose upbringing like, different to most kids that I deal with now is like I, never in my life did I ever contemplate going to college or university like it never got discussed at dinner or even the teachers at school they never even mentioned college and uh, you know I finished high school at 17 and uh, my parents you know the day after I finished high school they drove me up, to, up a couple of hours north of Sydney to become a working student for Heath Ryan and uh, it, I just felt that was pretty normal and you know, when I told my parents I wanted to go to um, America to ride horses full time, you know, they thought it was a great idea. They, they helped me pack my bags, you know, and uh, I, I see kids and young riders now, it's the opposite, you know, where they, they want them to get a real job and uh, they want them to get a degree. So they got something to fall back on and, uh, and, and moving to another country to chase your athletic dreams would be uh it would be a, a huge debate or talking point in the, at the family dinner table. So, uh, you know, in some ways I uh, was lucky I wasn't that gifted or any good at school or, um, you know, it was right from the get-go, it was pretty obvious what I was going to do um, right from a young age. So it was, you know, complete focus and, uh, um, you know, not, I had nothing else basically in my life than just to compete with horses and, you uh, in a weird kind of way, it's uh, sometimes not having a better option is a, a very easy, easy. Um, you know, you don't have you don't have anything else to think about except doing this. So. Did your were your parents? Did they have horses? Did they ride? Yeah, I mean, we grew up on uh, about. I think we had three acres, sort of about forty five minutes north of Sydney, and um, my mum did a bit of eventing, and then my sister did a bit of eventing. She she rode up to like the three or four star level, and then. Um, I was sort of the last one in our family to, to take up horses probably when I was, I don't know, 11 or 12. And, you know, Pony Club was down the road and did that. And all, all my mates from school had horses and we used to, you know, get off the school bus and jump on the horses and go racing around the, the National Forest. And, uh, you know, it wasn't very conventional riding, but it was uh, it was fun. And then, you know, eventing um, as a young guy in Australia, uh, was it was like camping you know you'd go to the event you'd never stay in a hotel you'd, you'd sleep in a tent or in the back of the truck and you'd, you'd build your own yard for your, your horses and 
you know, in the middle of the night, the horses all get loose and they'd be galloping around the event and, you know, you just caught them in the morning. Or, and I, I mean, I know it sounds dramatic, but it, it's just what it is, you know, and uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, I think, you know, looking back on your life, there was a couple of key people that changed you, changed my path. Obviously, my parents were great. And then uh, the guy I became a working student for, Heath Ryan, was um, – just an electric uh, uh, character and driven and yelling and screaming and hard working. And uh, it was just the, the perfect, perfect person for me. It might, you know, I was a wild boy, you know, at, at 17 years old, I could have gone that way or that way. And uh, it was just the perfect scenario where this, this guy that mentored me or, or you sort of work for as a the boss and uh, I mean, he was half a maniac. He worked you to death and uh, told you, you could go to the Olympics and, um, taught you everything about horses. You know, we branded them, we broke them in, we got horses off the track. We went to venting, you know, like it was uh, just the, the perfect um, little bit by luck, or maybe my parents recognized that this guy would be perfect for me. And, uh, and at the time there was just so many people working for Heath Ryan in that sort of umbrella. There was Kevin McNabb and Jock Pageant, Chris Burton was down the road and, you know, all scruffy, skinny, half drunk young boys that loved horses, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's very, it's awesome just seeing how everyone sort of progressed in, in the world. And most of them went to England and did well. And I I came to America. I was going to ask that. So why, why America? Uh, well, funny enough, my, I remember I was 12 years old and my parents took me to the American consulate in Sydney to get dual citizenship. And uh, I remember going there. It took all day, and I, I said, "Why? Why the hell would I need an American passport?" And um, I mean, you wouldn't believe it, but uh, you know, twenty years later or whatever, it was either go to England and fill out all the visas and <laughs> stuff to go live in England, or hey, you could go to America on a cargo plane with a horse, and you could just live there and work there, no problem. So. Uh, <laughs> I said, well, I'll, I'll give this a crack, you know, see you fellas yeah. later. And uh, it was a great decision. I mean, I, it was the best thing I ever did. And uh, it was, a, you know, it was a, you often wonder in your life if you didn't take that brave step to, to, to come over here where, you know, I think I would have been all right in Australia. Like I had a good little business going, but it's very, very remote and um, a little bit primitive. And I mean, you could still make a good living out of it, but it's, I don't, you know, I don't think... I could have done what I've done if I stayed there. What was, you know, when you came over here, what was one of the big culture changes? And and is there something that you brought with you that you feel like is always going to be a hardcore part of who you are that came from where you grew up and things that have shifted since you've been in America? Like there's a big culture change there, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah I mean, pretty much everything, you know, like I got here and, uh, then I met a vet called Kevin Keane, who's been uh, one of my best friends ever since and been a just phenomenal vet for me. And uh, he was telling me that we, we should trot the horses up once a week. And I was like, what do you mean? I think he's sound. And, uh, and like uh, we'd never in Australia ever get a joint injection or ever call the vet. You know, we'd try and figure it out ourselves. And they're probably half lame and we didn't even know it, you know. And, uh, you know, coming to America, you the scrutiny and the focus and the detail of the, the vet work, you know, this is one example, the vet work. I mean, just holy hell, this is, you know, different to what I've experienced. And even just the events, I remember my first event I went to was Southern Pines and I slept just in my sleeping bag and uh, it, the tack room there and people were taking photos of me and uh, I didn't know anyone there. I'd ne- and uh, everyone was staying in hotels and there was all the stables there for the horses and, um, Let's see, that was 2006. And um, yeah, it was, I was, and then also walking the course with a coach. Like uh, I met Philip Dutton at, at Carolina International and he said, oh, I'm, I'm walking a group around the advanced course if you want to come walk. And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, like in Australia, we'd just walk the course and try and figure it out yourself. And over here, the, the coaching and um, the detail of, you know, pacing out the strides and the lines and, like it was, uh, you know, and everyone sort of getting warmed up in the show jumping with a trainer, you know, like we'd just mm-hmm. be out there winging it ourselves, you know. And uh, so uh, there was a big change. And, I, you know, I, I think there's obviously huge positives in 
in the changes I found. And but then there was a few um, few negatives too, where you, you get you're not self sufficient. You know, when you're, you're always mm-hmm. getting told what to do by a coach, and um, you know you lose a little bit of the horseman culture of just calling the vet once a week to look at every horse. You don't have to sort of feel your animal or get an understanding of you know, I just, if the horse is lame, I just call the vet now where before in Australia, you'd sort of lunge it and you'd flex its ankle and you get the hoof testers out and you'd, you know, get your friend over to ask his opinion, what he thinks of it, you know, like, so now I don't do any of that. So I'm, I'm truly Americanized. <laughs> <laughs> Was it hard to, or did you, did you, were you automatically a good learner? Like if you hadn't had to be in situations where you were being coached or you were always kind of figuring it out on your own. Was it hard to shift and figure out how to take on the learning part of it? Or did that come pretty naturally from having competitive parents that were obviously influencing a lot of what you did in sport? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think for sure, like my riding went from here to here once I got to America. And and I think being around really good people was huge, like riding in in the same ring as Philip every day for years and years and years. I mean, that automatically just triggers improvement and for sure the the coaching i mean i get coached i probably eric devander probably helped me on seven horses this morning now you know mm-hmm. i'd never have that back in australia and so the you know it's it sounds gung-ho i'll just do it myself and i'll walk the course by myself but um the reality is that the, the level of competition now is just so high you know the the, go, the people you're riding it's just so good and you can't just wing it, you know, like you need eyes on the ground. You need someone looking from the ground, telling you what they see. You need trusted people coaching you, vets, farriers, the the whole, the grooms, teams around you, you know, like um, the staff that help you along. And I mean, there's just, you know, for sure the system I'm in now is is way better, way more professional. And, um, you know, but by saying that, I, I think, having my first sort of 10 years in Australia doing it the hard way and mm-hmm. making it happen without guidance. You've, you know, I rode my first five star when I was um, 19 years old, you know, and like I, looking back on it, like, and that's with the steeplechase and everything. Like I didn't really have a fitness program of what the course I couldn't have told you if it was five strides or six strides, you know, it was a, you know, to get through it, on those terms uh, means that you just had to, to, to just to do it on determination and grit and then, yeah. and then coming to America and adding the finesse and the, the polish to it. I think that that's sort of got, you know, got you from here to here sort of thing. So. Yeah. It seems like a really, um, what, like a healthy order to it that you, you, you get some, uh, like self-belief that you can do it, some core understanding that you can do it on your own. And then, yeah, there, there's been a lot of talk on, you know, certainly a lot of people I've talked to on this podcast about just kind of that self-belief that's just innately there. Like I was talking to Kim Severson a couple of weeks ago and she's like, you've got to just believe that you're okay and that you can do it. And that then everything on top of that is just a bonus and the help and the coaching and all of that. And that there are a lot of situations where, you know, for, for whatever reason, people end up being coached for the first 10 years or getting their hand held the first 10 years. And then it's very hard to find the kind of that internal like drive and, and belief and confidence without somebody externally giving it to you. Um, whereas it seems like the order in which you did it seemed to work quite well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, in hindsight, I wish, um, I wish I learned to ride more correctly early mm. on though like that would be the if i if i had my time over again i wish i learned the correctness first like, you know like it's one thing of having natural feel and natural ability and just winging it and but like having um like the technique a little bit yeah like you know sitting in a correct position and getting a true understanding of throughness and roundness and in dressage and um balance and stuff like that i, I I've had to break a lot of bad habits just Mm. because I didn't ever know know I was doing the wrong thing for so long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's probably, probably, you know, pros and cons for both, both ways. A a mixture of both, I think would be the best, um, you know, yeah, there's a way of doing that. (laughs) I think everybody's looking for that. When you are, you know, when you're coaching and you've got your students and your crew at your farm, 
Um, I mean, how do you manage that balance between the technique side of it, the coaching side of it, the grit side of it? I remember taking a, a cross country lesson with you years ago and I, I enjoyed it so much because you had a really unique way of saying, this is the technique, do this with your reins, do this, sit in this place. And then you said, and it should feel like this. And you'd say something about how it should feel or what it should look like. And it was a really great combination of kind of the, the imagery behind it and then the actual technique in which you were supposed to do it, which created a, a really nice picture, which made it easier to attain. But do you struggle at all when you are coaching people all the time, when to get involved, when not to get involved, how to, how to have people figured out on their own and where not to let them get too far astray? Does that make sense? Is there a question? In no, there? no, no. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, to be quite honest, I, I don't do that much coaching anymore. Um, I mean, I do clinics. I go away and do a bit of clinics around the countryside just to make money. And it's a good break from training horses. But I mean, I just coach the, the guys that work for me and mm -hmm. then a handful of riders. And uh, to be honest, I'm so busy with the, my own horses. I, I don't have that much time to do it properly. And uh uh, but by saying that, I, I do coach a couple of, you know, top riders and um, I don't know, I, I think I've been, I'm a bit of a con to be honest. I, I just think of all the great teachers that have helped me over the years and <laughs> and uh, I just sort of re-say what they've told me and uh, or, or, <laughs> or picked bits and pieces of what really clicked, you know, and uh, if you know, I've stolen ideas from some of the great jumping trainers and dressage trainers and cross country guys that I've worked with and sort of blended it all together of what worked for me. And, um, and then basically when I'm helping the, the small group that I help, I'm more just trying to verbalize what I would do if I was sitting on the horse. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like, um, then it's complete honesty it's it's the truth okay if i was riding this horse how would i want it shaped how would i want it go how would i sit on the horse what speed would i come to the jump what position you know what technique i'd use and and then um you know and, and i think that's the the best advice i can give of, of the things that have worked through for me and i've been at it for a while now so uh you know over the years i've made so many mistakes and screwed up so many times of what not to do and uh you know it's uh still learning though it's uh, still evolving and uh it's it's yeah. uh, it's a funny a funny sport you know you think you know what you're doing and then you look at yourself five years ago and you realize five years ago you didn't even have a clue what you're doing and but at that time you thought you were pretty good you know and i every five years i look back on five years before and thought i knew what i knew good then and now you know I've, feel like it's a, a wise man's game it's a, it t takes so long to to learn everything and all the horses are so different and um you know obviously i think your technology is changing too with um where you train horses and you get them fit and you know i'm very lucky at the farm we are at here now we've got gallop tracks and water treadmills and indoor arenas and cross-country yeah. courses so like the to prepare horses or to improve horses is is uh, so much easier now. So. How, you know, you think about that from what the, the image you, you spoke about earlier when you went eventing in Australia and you're camping out and building a paddock for the night. And now you look at the yard that you're at now, that the farm that you've built now, how has your business model and speaking about the clinics, how has your business model evolved? You know, there's obviously the business side of it and the competition side, and they're married somewhere in, in the middle, mm. but you really, kind of created an empire there and was that was that always the vision or has that kind of evolved over time well i mean one of the great things about america is if you if you want something you, you go for it and, and america is this is a great country that you just make it happen you know and uh and the great thing about america you just can keep borrowing money and just keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and uh so i've thrived on that technique and uh <laughs> You know, it's uh, it's been enjoyable. I, I have to say, it's a, it's a huge juggling act. You know, well, I'm sure you guys are the same. As um, you know, one side of the coin, you're trying to be as good as you can be. You're trying to improve yourself. You're trying to train. You're trying to be concentrating. And then, on the other side of it, you know, you owe the bank four million dollars. You know, and so it's sort of like I've got to pay for it and do this, this, and this. And by the way, I'm trying to be the best in the world, and I've got to improve. And uh, 
you know, it's a, it's a tricky balance. It's a very tricky balance. And, um, you know, I, I suppose the hard thing in America is there's, you know, I, I think 50, 60, 70% of equestrian businesses aren't funded from, from lessons and horses in training and sponsors and clinics and prize money. It's, it's funded elsewhere. And, uh, you know, in a weird kind of way, I'm sort of glad that Silver and I have created this thing and, you know, we've got no plan B here. You know, we've got to come up with a business structure that this place, place has got to pay for itself. And, and we can't get so obsessed with paying for it that we just concentrate on that. You know, like you, we've got to, you know, going to the Olympic games is, is, is financially not a, uh, a profitable decision, you know, it's uh, yeah. but by saying that it, also, if you do that, you can bring in some new sponsors and owners and clients and yada, yada, yada. So it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. Uh, by saying that, if you're a professional writer, you have got absolutely nothing to complain about. Like if you think of the, the millions of people in the world that sit in a car all day to drive in traffic to an office and they sit at a desk and they're in front of a computer and they're typing away and then they sit in the bathroom and check their Facebook on their phone and then they're looking at the clock and hanging out till it says 10 30 so they can have a 15 minute coffee break. And, you know, look at us, we're out here riding horses around. We, you've got, uh, you know, we, the, we, you know, we, we have got absolutely nothing to whinge and whine about. Yes. There's sacrifices. Uh, I've missed a lot of birthday parties. I've seen parents in years and years and uh, you know, it's seven days a week work and, Yada yada yada, but like it's uh, man. I mean, there's just so many. Yeah, it's a uh, what do they call it? First world problem. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the whingers and whiners in the horse sports is uh, have it. You know, take a look around. Yes, it's hard work and it's a grind, but man, you're getting to do something you you enjoy doing, you love doing. It's it's long hours. It's a uh, there's a lot of headaches and challenges, but man, you got nothing to complain about if you can, if you can somehow figure out a way of doing horses for a career. Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is hard work enough? Is there, is there more, can you just be a hard worker and be successful in this game or is there more to it after, after you get to the point where you're like, I'm working as hard as I can work? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think, I do think ha being a hard worker is essential. But then being a hard, hard, hard worker can be a detriment, you know, and, uh, you know, I've had the, the, the guy that I learnt off in, in Australia, Heath Ryan, was the most hardest work I have ever seen. Like, I mean, I've seen nothing like it. Like he'd wake up at five in the morning and he'd teach seven dressage lessons, screaming and yelling, and then he'd train all the kids that worked for him. And then at 4 PM, he'd finally start riding his own horses and he'd ride till 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, and this was seven days a week. I mean, it was, it was sickening. And uh, it, it also being that hard of a worker, I mean, he, I mean, he rode at the Olympics in the wagon all that, but it was working so hard at everything, but, you know, he spent 20% of the time improving himself and 80% of the time doing everything else. And, uh, you know, so being a, a hard, hard worker sometimes can be a detriment where, you know, teaching lessons till 10 o'clock at night, yes, you earn money, but, you know, if you're in Ocala, you could go to the World Equestrian Centre and stand by the warm-up ring and, and watch Scott Keach warm his horse up, you know. And to me, instead of making the hundred bucks in a riding lesson, you could learn a lot more if you just had an hour spare to, to critique and watch the the best mm -hmm. of the best working their horses. I mean, that's just one example. So I think, yeah, yeah, there's no question you have to work hard, but then working hard at the important things, I think, you know, the, the name of the game. I mean, everyone's got to make money. So, uh, and you got to pay for all this, but then, you know, you can't you know, sell all your best horses and, be at the competition and walk in the course with all the kids that you teach and then quickly get on your horse and do the competition. You know, like there's got to be moments where you cut off and you, you focus on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. If you were going to kind of describe the atmosphere in your barn with your team and your staff and your crew, is it a balance of kind of what you grew up 
with and kind of where you're headed now? What does that look like? How would you describe that space? You know, I, I mean, I've, this is what I think. Uh, they're, they're still working. I mean, the, the guys, that, I mean, we're so busy at the moment. These guys start at 6.30 in the morning and they're nonstop till 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. And I mean, it is, it was just monotonous, hard, hard work. And I mean, I think we uh, do a top job. We get horses in work. We've got, you know, competitions every weekend. And it is such long, long hours. I mean, I've got so much appreciation and admiration for these guys. So uh, in our barn, like I think it's it's a lot of younger people. Um, I don't, I no longer take anyone under 18. I think um, that under 18 it's sad to, for me to say because I got started when I was under 18, but like it's sometimes they're too young, you know, like you're on the phone talking to their parents and their parents are telling them they got to do school work or they got, you know, like it and all the, you know, you, all the drama with safe sport and all that crap is I just don't want to even go yeah. to a, to a younger person. They've got to be under eight. Uh, they're going to be over 18 and they've got to understand that this is, uh, this is not a, part-time gig this is all in give it everything you got and so most of them stay here for years though i mean there's been guys that have been here five six seven eight years um and uh everyone gets paid here there's no um working student where you work here for free for lessons i think to me i just terrified that you know if i'm at a competition one weekend and then come home and then i'm right and i don't get to teach you a lesson i don't want you to feel that um you know you're working for free and then i didn't get around to helping you with your horse you know so I, every every single person gets paid mm. um have you always done it that way no i changed it a bit because i used to be able to get a heap of people that are young and naive to work for free but that it's it's <laughs> It's not fair either, you know. Like if I don't, what happens too is, you know, half the if half the people are getting paid and half of them aren't getting paid, then they're all working the same amount of time, and the people aren't getting paid. Are like freaking hell, I'm given, given everything I got too, and how come you get money and I don't? And and by saying that, I I try and help them as much as I can, but it can't interfere into my own mm. riding, if that makes any sense. I'm going to ride every horse that I want to ride every day, and then if there's time left over, I'll give you guys a hand jump on your horse and that so if they're getting paid then they're professional and there's an understanding that you know i'll do my very best to help you out but i'm this is not a riding school you know my i'm got to be a little bit selfish and just everything here is about performance and every person here is you know paid as a professional and you know and i think you know the culture in the barn i think that that because it's such long hours and such you know hard work there's a bit of banter and joking around and um but by saying that i also have learned the hard way that you can't be friends with any of them um uh you know and it's easier now that i'm getting a bit older than them all but um we don't hang out together we don't go to dinner together we no one comes maybe on christmas day we might silver might cook up a a brunch for the guys that work on christmas day and they can come to the house and so it's very clear that um i'm a nice guy you're a hard worker but we're we're not going drinking i mean i don't drink anyway but like we're not going out partying together we're not social um there's a, a clear line that um you know if work starts at 6 30 you have to be here at 6 30 or 6 29 one or the other and th there's a, a clear line of discipline by saying that i think you know i'm not a nazi you know i think having a joke and a laugh and and, uh, you know, I think there's a, a great atmosphere and um, uh, there's a, a camaraderie and, um, you know, we've got all sorts of horses here. There's race, two-year-old race horses getting started. There's horses in for breaking. There's Olympic eventers. There's retired horses. There's young horses. And uh, so a bit of everything like at Heath Ryan's when I got started. And, um, you know, I think the big thing too is that there's a very, very high standard of care and um, a high expectation of how things are done. Like, um, like a lot of every horse I have would have two riders on it. So I'd have a rider 
walking the horse for 45 minutes before I do dressage or, um, you know, maybe I do jumping and then it would do a 20 minute, um, walk in the pond with another rider. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that never ever in the world would there be a kid on the phone or someone with earphones on or any of that stuff, you know, like there's a, you know, it's a, the millions, millions and millions of dollars worth of horses. So it's, it, there's, it's not, this is not a riding camp. So it's, uh, so I think there's, uh, you know, I think having Silver here too, who's very German and from the dressage world is, you know, I think I'm probably laid back and, and she's probably the, you know, has everything very tidy and clean. And then to be honest, having my manager or um, head girl, uh, Steph, yeah. who's, uh, she's a top girl, but she's a savage, you know, like she, um, she, you know, that no one leaves until everything's just done perfectly. And unfortunately, you know, now I've got kids, I, you know, I, I basically, once I finish riding or whatever, I usually leave about five or whatever and go play around with the kids and that. And you need someone there making sure that every horse is groomed and legs are wrapped and aisles are swept. And you need that, that sort of manager person that, that it's, uh, kind but 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 very tough too so it's uh yeah but by saying that i I don't want to paint a picture of this militant um stable like it's uh you know like it's it's like it sounds like it's a uh, business yeah (laughs) yeah yeah and you know like there's uh great 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 people that work here and you know some of them stay three days and some of them stay three Mm -hmm. years so it's uh um it's a good system we got, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, I think we've perfected it. And, uh, I mean, it's taken a long time to get it like this too. It's, uh, um, but it's a, it's a balancing out. What I've learned though, is you need actually more staff than you think. And, mm. um, and you know, on a perfect day when it's just training horses and, you know, it's easy work. We'll actually get through it perfectly. It's, it's where you, you know, with I'm at a show with three or four horses and two grooms, and then one horse has got to go to the vet, and then another horse is going galloping, and then, and then one person's got the day off. That's when you need, um, you know, you need a lot of soldiers, and uh, to, to to do everything really, really well, I think that the key is the more than enough people. You know, if a horse is injured, it should be hand grazed three times a day. That for horses on the walk or there needs to be someone standing there with it, making sure it's, it's behaving. And, you know, like you can't, you can't do that unless you've got um, enough people and, you know, you got to work out what the, the, what the people are here for, you know, like are they, you know, it's not that much money in it, you know, so they, they obviously love horses or they've got a dream themselves that they feel like being here is going to make them better. Um, you know, there's, there's just, and you got to make sure that everyone that's here is, you got to treat them with respect. Um, you can't go around screaming and shouting and abusing people like that. Just not going to put up with it. You know, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be kind and gracious and appreciative, but then also just say, look, this is, there's no way around the hard work. This is every yeah. stall has to get cleaned twice a day. Every, every horse has to be brushed twice a day. You know, like it's just, mm-hmm. there's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of hard work. It's what it is. And the main, the horses that are all there, are they mainly horses that are on the path for you? Are there horses there that are just in training for somebody else or all the horses that are there in training are with the goal of being something great. And if they're not that they would get sold on. Yeah, man, it's changed a lot in the years. Uh, Like when I first came to America, it was take on all comers, you know, and uh, just, anything you know a, a, a paint horse that's never jumped before or a appaloosa that's rearing when you try and do dressage you know <laughs> and now uh, i mean we're lucky now where we're we're you know concentrating more just on top top quality performance horses so it's uh you know it's it's uh it's great i mean the it's a bit safer too <laughs> uh, yeah. because all, all the horses are good and then you know maybe if an owner or a, f- a good close friends has a horse that needs a bit of work. We'll, if we've got space, we'll, we'll slip it in. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and l- lately, I mean, how much of the work that, you know, on the other side, out of the tack, the work that you do as far as, um, you know, 
I was just checking out your website and there's like some slow motions of you in the gym, you know, everybody will check that out now, but how much <laughs> physical, physical work off the horses do you do? And as well, like mindset work and, um, you know, your, your diet, your health, how much does that play into what you're doing now? How much does that balance? Yeah, I mean, I had to do a 180. I mean, about, I mean, I was bulletproof for so many years and, um, you know, party all night and work all day and eat whatever I want. And, and then about five years ago, I just started getting hurt and injury after injury after injury. I tore my groin, groin four times. I've probably, you know, I've got plates in both collarbone, a rod down my arm, a rod down my leg. And, you know, it's endless the injuries I had. And sadly it started to get to a point where I thought, holy crap, I'm, you know, I, I don't even feel like I'm halfway through my career and um, my body's just not holding up, you know, and it was terrifying actually. Like I, especially in about um, 2019, I think I tore my groin like three times in 12 months. And I thought, you know, I remember going to the hospital and just to ask them this doctor, this sports doctor, if I can keep going. And uh, so right then and there, I thought, right, I've got to, if I'm going to, I want to achieve my goal at keep riding till I'm 65. I, I got a, I'm going to have to change a lot of things. So now it's uh it's very different. You know, it's uh, every morning for about an hour, an hour and a half. It's um, either one morning a week or two mornings a week. I do virtual yoga with mm -hmm. a lady called biz that uh, only just works with professional athletes, uh, a lot of football players and that, that goes my hips and groin. And then, two mornings a week, a physiotherapist will come to my house, to my basement to work on me for an hour and a half. And then I train in Aiken with a trainer and, um, and then also working now with a girl in California called Shelby that specializes in um, just riders. And that's actually been interesting because it's a, you know, it's a very, you know, specific sports specific exercise. I did that this morning actually. And then um, diet wise, you know, like a, being injured and that and you know you get heavy pretty quick so uh obviously most you know nine ten months of the year i'm pretty pretty careful with what i eat i don't really eat meat and then i quit drinking as well which i don't know like i i not, i have nothing against anyone that drinks but like for sure for me like it was just you know a couple of beers every single night you wake up a bit hung over and feel like shit till about lunchtime and then all right and then you have a couple more beers in the afternoon and, you know and it was just this vicious cycle of um you know just getting through the day so um that's been a a good change and to be honest I, was that a hard change did you have how did you do I that i thought it would be i just stopped you know and um mm. and um to start with the hardest part's like social occasions you know and uh like i love having a cold beer with friends at a barbecue or dinner or whatever but it's uh i don't know it was just it was causing me too many mm. headaches and in, it impacted me neg negatively so um so that's been a good change to be honest and um and also the keeping your weight off too so that's um sort yeah. of i've had this this pattern throughout my whole life of extremities you know of not drinking and then drinking a lot then not drinking and then drinking a lot and i think not drinking is better <laughs> yeah. uh, well and also i'm sure it you notice this as well it's it's like you have a second life that starts when you get home again when you have two young children that are never i'm sure your kids are filled with energy and want that time to run around and play and at the end of the day i mean it's, you, you gotta be tired when you get home so having a yeah a, a, a well-rounded balance so you can just keep up is probably mm inspiration there too yeah and you s sleep better and i don't know I, I i being being healthy as you get older is uh you know like i said before i mean i was the life of the party for so long and if i could change one thing that would be it like i was a i was wild man when i was in my late teenagers and my 20s and that and um you know i just i don't think I, you know i competed at the top of the sport but i wasn't you know, ultra, ultra serious. And it did, I mean, it's confusing too, is you don't get confused with, I still have fun and enjoy myself. It's just, 
you know, I go to bed at nine o'clock now, you know, and uh, having kids and, and uh, you know, I've, I've, you, you don't realise how short your window is, you know, you get a couple of good horses that, that could go to these championships and you never know, this could be my last championship ever, you know, and uh, it'd be dumb to look back on it in years to come and say, man, I could have tried a bit harder. I could have mm. given it more. And yeah. uh, if you fail, I think it's better if you fail knowing that you just gave your best. Yeah. So 65, that's the, that's the target. Uh, I honestly, I want Wayne Quarles, the technical delegate to come up to me one day and say, listen, pal, you're dangerous on this course. <laughs> Yeah, you're not to ride anymore. He hasn't you're done out. that yet. <laughs> no. Wayne Quarles, well, Gretchen Butts, one of those TDs. I want them to tap me on the shoulder and say, listen, old fella, you're too dangerous and uh, reckless riding. We're giving you a yellow card. That's basically when I think I'll retire. <laughs> uh, that is um, that is awesome. Um I sent you some um, questions. I'm not sure if you got them. I, I'm terrible at checking my emails. So. It's okay. It's okay. We can do it on the fly. But I, we tend to wrap with these questions um, on each of our podcasts with all of our guests. So if um, if you're if you're keen, I'll go ahead and ask a few of them, and you can just answer them as we go. Just rattle on, mate. I will do it. That's what I do. What is the biggest lesson a horse has taught you about yourself? Uh, the fastest ways to go slow. I think um, taking your time and being patient and not trying to rush them to the next event has served me well. But I've done the opposite so many times and regretted it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's one of those ones you you keep learning. Um, and was that something that happened in the last five years, ten years? 20 years last month. No, I think, I, yeah, no, I'm, st I'm still an idiot looking back on it. You know, like <laughs> there's so, m so many times that deep down in my heart of hearts, I knew the horse wasn't ready for competition. And, you know, mm -hmm. I told myself, oh, the owners bought the ticket to come to watch the event. And I promised everyone I was going to ride him at this show. And gee, he doesn't feel right, but I'm, I, th I think I'm going to get away with it. And um, yeah, nine times out of 10, it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've been doing that for about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now when you have one, when you get that kind of feeling with one, are you, you just halt, you call the owners, you have a chat? What's your go-to? Well, I'm, I'm lucky now. Like I've got a, a bunch of top horses now. And mm -hmm. I, I'm in a, you know, if you've only got one or two horses, it's it's hard. You know, like if you don't go to the show, then you don't go to the show. Where I, I'm in a fortunate position now where I've got a number of top horses and I, I suppose subconsciously I know I could slow one down or, or ease off on one, but I still got three or four at the, at the next competition. So um, it's a, it's a luxurious position to be in because you, you can afford to back off them yeah. or slow down or go back a level knowing that, Hey, I've still got some other advanced horses that we can crack on at the big shows on. So it's, it's a harder decision when I think you've just got one or two top horses and you're, you're just desperate to compete at the top of the sport. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's hard. The, the injuries, if I could change one thing, the injuries of the horses, that's it. It's just uh, that's the part that really stings, you know, of, the, you know, finding a horse, then, then convincing or, or getting people excited to own the horse and bringing the horse here and then spending years and years training it and having dreams and high hopes and, ad, you know, aspirations for the horse and then, and then getting an injury. Oh man, it still stings. Uh, even, even it, like it's never an easy phone call, and um, it's just the uh, the nature of the beast, unfortunately. How do you, um, you know, how do you think about or speak about when there is that critical side to the sport when you have horses getting injured or or dying and people getting hurt? How do you process that? Um. You know, I, th I think you've got to accept that, you know, eventing is similar to racing, you know, that, that, that we're, what we're trying to do in this sport is is gallop a horse at 570 metres for 
three miles over obstacles that are this big. It's, I mean, injuries are going to happen. And to get them fit and strong and ready for that competition, you've got to, you've got to push them in training. You've got to gallop them fast. You've got to build up their stamina. You've got to jump fences. And by doing all that, there is, uh, there is a risk there. Um, injuries, I, um, I suppose I've got a poor, I've got my mindset on injuries is you, you just, if you're going to do this for a job, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get hurt over and over and over again and suck it up. And I've been hurt more times than everyone put together and heal up and it's part of it. And I don't feel sorry for you. Mm. And I mean, the, the part that is, is that really hits home is, uh, you know, the, uh, Sadly, known people that have been killed with in Australia and here in America that um, are some of the best people I've ever known, you know, and and good riders, and it is a, a it's a tough, tough sport, similar to racing a car or rock climbing or something. Is one, you know, if a horse falls and it falls this much that way instead of that way, or if ground slips so you lose i don't know like it, there is just this this horrible chance that it's it can be catastrophic so um that part really really um is upsetting and uh but this is the life we've chosen you know and um it's you know i think you can avoid personal injuries or accidents by being well prepared and training correctly and having good well talented horses, but there, you know, there's still this, this, this risk involved, and um, the courses I feel like are getting safer, and but it's still dangerous. You know, we have got this cross country schooling course here, and I mean, it's just even riding young horses today. I was cross country young horses today, and they just don't quite understand it, and they misread a jump, and they bump it, and you know, you get away with it but you know every every now and then it you know it's it's, it's horrible you know, the sirens are here and there's an ambulance here mm. catching someone up so do you do you have any level of fear when you're riding when you're on these young horses when you're schooling when you're unsure um i have no to be quite honest with you i have absolutely riding at like the four and five star level or a championship level i have absolutely no concern about getting hurt myself like it just does not enter my mind and i have a mindset that i'm completely actually fine with falling off at kentucky and breaking my arm my leg and my shoulder all in one hit like i just i'm comfortable with that idea i feel like i'm I'm so determined to go for it and make it happen that this could be the outcome. And, you know, you get to lie in bed for a couple of weeks and you'll be back. Um, the young horses, I've got to say that they're, I've got a, a young uh, Peruvian guy that helps me with the young horses. And uh, I've turned into a bit of a, a big baby now. And uh, he often takes them out on the cross country course for the first time or jumps them for the first time. And, um, I think, you know, the young horses, I, I found <laughs> I get hurt on them more than often. So uh, I've got a Canadian guy too that does the real young horses, does the breakers and the babies and stuff like that. And he's like a little monkey on them. So uh, I I, uh, I love the young horses. I love having this sort of diamond in the rough and seeing, a, you know, a three and four year old gawky horse develop over the years. But I... Uh, riding them but i uh you know i uh i'm getting old now i uh i leave that to the these young uh young 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 riders that uh help me with the youngsters so. and at what point would you or is it different with every horse at what point would you take over the ride on that horse when it's deemed safe <laughs> yeah i mean um we'd, we'd have a bunch of four and five year olds horses here i think once they're five and they, you know, they look like they're quality horses. I sort of step in, and to be honest, I'm competing the upper level horses a lot. And um, uh, you know, the, the the rider I've got now, uh, Diego Favre from Peru. I mean, he's been to the Pan American Games. He's uh, ridden Grand Prix show jumping. I mean, he's a magnificent rider, and he spends all day with them too. You know, like I. Um, so, but by saying that, I think this weekend I'm riding. Um, couple uh 
first timers at training level that are five years five years old and I schooled them today and it was uh it was exciting but uh you know the 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 this is the part, you know, to, to consistently stay at the top of the sport, you need this pipeline of horses coming through. It's, uh, um, the, the, the true champions um, in horse sports seem to be able to stay at the top level of the sport for decades. And, the, you know, the key is to have horses climbing through the ranks. And, you know, a lot of them aren't going to make it. They're not going to be sound enough. They're not going to jump good enough. They can't gallop you know, yada, yada, yada. So you, you do need a squadron of quality horses coming through and, and finding those horses is hard. Finding people to own them is even harder. And then also having good, good riders and care to produce them in a correct way where they, they learn to, they learn that they to love their job and they learn that they have to jump from this side of the jump to the other, no matter what. And, um, uh, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a juggling act and uh, yeah. but it's fun i love it so yeah. do you have a favorite training or competition mantra that you reference regularly um like a saying or yeah like something you'd say to yourself or you always are saying to you know students you're walking with or something you use at a competition that just kind of snaps you into the right frame of mind uh not really i mean i I definitely feel like mentally uh, at the big competitions, I've sort of fall into my own little world a little bit. And it's very hard. Like the like Kentucky three day events are it's like the greatest event in the world, but it is so hard to perform there. You know, you're just getting pulled in every single different direction, you know, with um, everything going on and um, to give your best performance, there's a real challenge, you know? And so, I don't know, there's a, I don't know if it's a mindset or whatever, but like it's, it's you know, there's got to be a way where you can just sort of block it, you know, try and block everything out and find moments and calmness and hide away a bit and concentrate on your event and then still live up to your, you know, your commitments, you know, these owners own horses for you, the sponsors sponsor you that they, um, and uh, you agreed to, you know, to, to be their man. So you've got to, you got to do your thing and uh, be part of it all. And, and I'm very grateful for them. So I think it would be obnoxious and rude to say, guess what guys, see you later. Now that you've given me everything I want, I'm, I'm off on my own, but there, you know, you've got to, you've got to try and try and find that balance somehow. So. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's getting harder as you get older or more successful or something. You know, I think, saying no has been one of my hardest thing is, is saying no to people that want lessons or no to someone that wants to send you a horse when you don't have time to train it. And, you know, deep down in Australia, like you're just so desperate for business, you'd never say no to anything. And now um, I think to be very, very, very good, you have to, you have to block things out and say, no, I, I just can't do this. I don't have the time. And, uh, and also you, I don't want to be a, I want to be a good father too. You know, I've got to, you could get so obsessed and driven and borderline crazy doing this job. You, you know, you, you don't want to be some absent father that doesn't have anything to do with their kids. So I think, you know, there's, you have to block out time and, and try and do that properly too. Otherwise you're just a wanker. <laughs> and we wouldn't get to watch like the, the future Ninja warrior on your Facebook page. Right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there a piece of advice someone gave you along the way that you still reference today? Oh man, I got so many pieces of advice, but I, I mean, I, I, I'd have to say, I don't know if it's advice, but I do think, um, resilience is a, a huge part of this sport, you know, like in the sense of, um, um, having this ability to just keep hanging in there and hang in there and hang in there and everything's going wrong. Your staff quitting and owners taking a horse off you and your wife hates you. And you just got to have this ability where you just can keep hanging in there and hanging in there and hanging in there. And the, you know, you go on events where every event you go to, you fall off a horse and you feel like an idiot and, you know, and, and, um, true champions, uh, you know find a way just of sticking at it you know and stick to itness you know and and not giving up and some people sometimes people give up without even admitting they're giving up you know they just back away and 
and get comfortable of, okay, well, I just, you know, I just, I'll still do horses, but I'm just going to teach a couple of riding lessons and, yeah. you know, not go after it, you know. And so I think, um, you know, you, for me anyway, to, to, to stay hungry and desperate to get better, I mm. think that's the hardest part as well as you get to 40 and you got every reason in the world to do everything in your day, but except to train hard. Mm. And that is a, that's the kiss of death, you know, and uh, my mentors or people that I've admired, just like Philip Dutton, he's 58 years old. He's still getting lessons. He's still walking the course with coaches. He's still searching for better horses. And, um, and I still, I believe he's riding better now than he was five years ago, you know? And so that's, a lot of people just plateau out and say, oh, well, this is about as good as I'm going to be. This, I'll just ride like this, you know? And um, so it's important not to fall into that trap. Um, so it's, you know, you've got to be desperate to get better and um, hungry. And I don't know, it's a, uh, can send you, you know, mental health to, is a real thing, you know, because uh, to be as good as some of these other guys you're trying to compete against, you, you've got to be half crazy, you know, of, or that driven, I don't want to say crazy, but just obsessed and driven and, you know, like, you know, a, a heroin addict or a meth addict when they're just desperate for a hit of drugs <laughs> and they'll just do anything to, yeah. to, to get it and yeah. they'll steal money off their parents or they'll jump in a car and drive three hours away to the inner city. Like you've got to almost be that desperate. And that mm. hungry and that obsessed to keep getting better. And that's a hard thing to do as you get older. It's easy when you're 20 or 25, yeah. but when you're 42, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you got to push yourself. Do you find that when you get into that state that it, that you can stay like focused enough to learn, to get better, to, to make good choices, or it just doesn't even matter. Like you're just, I think what I've found too is like um, basically from seven in the morning to about two o'clock, I'd call it sort of high performance time. Mm -hmm. And I'd try and not have any, I don't take phone calls then. I don't teach lessons then. I wouldn't meet the fencer to talk about building a new fence on the farm then. Mm -hmm. It would just be out of concentration. And then after two o'clock, it's a bit of a schmozzle, you know, like in your running around teaching lessons on the phone you know meeting the builder about your new stable fixing a jump moving the cross-country jumps figuring yeah. out staffing talking you know yada 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 and then it's sort of it's a little bit chaotic then but i think trying to have this this window of time where you you're really you know trying to concentrate on, on being as good as you can be which is hard when you've got a business and there's this temptation or lure of hey guy if you can I can only come at 11 o'clock for a lesson. Can you fit me in sort of thing? And to me, that sort of ruins the pattern of the rhythm of the day a bit too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you do when you are seeking inspiration? You know, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm so, I'm just surrounded by great people, you know, and, uh, so when I say people, you know, I think my, my close friends, you know, especially the Australian guys, they've sort of have gone through the same experience of leaving their friends and family and moving here for this. And then my sort of circle, uh, you know, I don't have huge amounts of close friends, but the my coaches and mentors um, are top-notch people. You know, I think uh, Peter Wilde and Eric Devander and Silver are sort of my main three coaches who are all brilliant and they're we're friendly but they're they also don't you know when you you get good everyone tells you what you want to hear a bit and they're right. completely honest and then i think uh i suppose you'd call him a good friend but he's been more of a father figure philip dutton would be you know he's been a, a just a great person to tap me on the shoulder and tell me i'm a dickhead when i'm a dickhead and uh also ring him up and uh, ask him questions or advice he's brilliant and on top of that he's a, a good mate you know and then you know around that the the, the staff led by um, Steph 
and then a couple of these guys that have worked me for me for five or six years have sort of a core group around me that I could ring up two o'clock in the morning and ask them to come pick me up because I've got a flat tire. They'd jump out of bed, they'll do it. And, you know, my vet, Kevin Keane, has come and, and you know, he, he's been, you know, th- those people, they, they don't do it for money either. You know, like they, they've invested into the horses or the program or the, the dream or the goal and they've got the same ambition and, yeah, yeah you pay them, but they're – for what you pay them, it's not really what yeah. <laughs> what, what they, if you bet they make money more money doing something else, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people that seems to be uh, a key ingredient to the recipe for success is surrounding yourself with that. Type and I have of- to say, you know, and uh, I think Silver, like to be honest, like top girl, you know, like she's pretty uh, tough tough bird you know like she uh I mean, she's she's half nuts you know like she wakes up at five o'clock in the morning and she's ridden two horses by seven and then comes in the house and getting the kids all organized and um you know and then at any moment when i'm away she'll be training my horses and then at the competition she'll be coaching me and uh um having a life partner is um probably the same in in, in your in your relationship with tick is like having someone that's on the same journey like i don't think i could have done any of this by myself you know mm-hmm. like uh even just the, the 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 horrible thought of borrowing all this money to build this farm and having another person contributing to the income and the same person that's got the same passion as you with horses and then obviously with the family and taking care of the kids and i mean she's pretty tough on me i have to say she could be nicer to me now and then <laughs> But uh, all in all, all in all, it was a, you're gonna like, keep her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think I could have bought, I could have got one that was like a bit nicer and like brought me bottles of water. You know, like some of those wives at the shows, they come out. They, you want to drink it? Like she doesn't do that. <laughs> I I have to say, one of my favorite memories of you talking about Silva was we were in. Um, Normandy and I think we were wait we went to lunch all of us were going we we're going to lunch we were waiting to get our gear or something and everybody was going around the table I don't we were talking about our last meal what the last meal we would have in right. jail or, or before we get executed or something <laughs> stopped for a second and he said you know if I could change one thing about Silva and I'm thinking I'm like this is gonna be <laughs> intense like she she doesn't like McDonald's she won't eat <laughs> <laughs> Like, well, that's a pretty good marriage there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't get her to like McDonald's. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It was hilarious. Uh, I would imagine she's <laughs> a pretty tough cookie. <laughs> yeah. All right, our last, our last question, um, and you might have answered this a few different ways, but um, have you had an experience or adversity separate from horses in your life that you feel like has directly influenced you as a horseman? Yeah, uh, you know, I think going through the barn fire in um, 2011, yeah, 2011, mm. well, that was a big, um, you know, it was a big moment personally, I think, you know, like it was, uh, you know, one of those moments where you thought everything was going wrong. And, um, you know, everything was going wrong. You know, the, we just started our own business and the freaking building catches on fire and all the horses die and freaking we had to ring up all the owners and we lost all of our equipment. And it was just, you know, like uh, that was a moment where it was, you know, maybe we should just go back to Australia, you know, and uh, and to hang in there and, and uh, push through that one. I think basically anything – like it's not going to get much worse than that yeah. or, or it, I don't think it can get worse than that. So if you overcome that, I sort of subconsciously, whatever, you know, like if, mm-hmm. you know, if, if uh, you can get through that, something like that, I think then it, it's, there's not much else that can push you to fold things up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. I mean, how do you have a way or is it just innately who you are? Was it something from when you were young or how you were raised? Because you do have an incredible 
ability to bounce back. I mean, it's pretty mm. unique from whether it's something as outrageous as that barn fire to your injuries. And and I know I'm hearing you say like you just you just got to keep going, but it is incredibly mm. unique. And is that been something like nature or nurture? Is it just been the way that you processed things and carried on? Or has it been something you were really aware you needed to, like, if you're going to go down a road, I've got to kind of not get weighed down by this? Well, a couple of things. I think being from Australia, you got a bit of a chip on your shoulder of um, something in the culture there that you just got a built in grit and determination. I think it's something that the Australian culture breeds into people. Um, second part is like that. I don't actually have a plan B, you know, there's no fallback plan. There's no secret trust fund. There's no um, um, like the, this has to work no matter what. And, and if it doesn't work, like, it's over, you know, like we're screwed, you know, so there's not a, um, you know, there's not this little voice in your head. And, and I suppose the other thing is if you, you're, you come from the other side of the world to live in America for, for one reason and one reason only, and it's to be great at eventing. I mean, you've made a pretty big deal with yourself. You know, you've made a, a huge deal with yourself as I'm going to, sell everything I got. I'm not going to see my friends or family ever again. I'm going to miss every Christmas dinner. I'm probably not going to go to any birthday parties. I'm going to lose touch with every friend that I grew up with for one reason and one reason only and it's because I've got this ambition to chase this dream of competing horses. That's a, it's a pretty big deal that you, you, you're committed to yourself and um, I've never even thought about it but you know, getting on that cargo plane and mm. coming over here with horses with that one reason mm -hmm. means that it's you're all in. You know, there's no, there's nothing, nothing else. There's uh, you got to make it happen, no matter what. Mm. Well, I commend you, my friend. I think you're doing a pretty, pretty good <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I so appreciate you taking this time and. Um, and wishing you the best of luck in the next month or so and after that <laughs> and um yeah sending everything your way we thank you so much for coming on to onto our little show and i know i'm feeling very inspired so i appreciate okay. that <laughs> all right Shanaid. namaste thank you <laughs> namaste. so much <laughs> i really hope you enjoyed that conversation before you go, I just want to let you know more about Ride IQ. At its core, Ride IQ gives everyone access to instruction from the best equestrian coaches in the world. It might sound impossible, but with Ride IQ, you get access to the private mobile app that has hundreds of on demand, listen while you ride audio lessons taught by top riders and coaches in eventing, hunter jumpers, and dressage. Here's how it works you look through the app and choose a lesson based on your horse or a skill you're working on. There are lessons for green off the track thoroughbreds and nervous horses and horses that are behind the leg as well as lessons that teach every stage of skills like shoulder in or trot lengthenings. Then you tack up and press play and you have a top coach like Doug Payne or Leslie Law or Gina Smith in your ear guiding you every step of the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, it is always appreciated if you can take a moment to share the podcast with your friends and family and leave a review on your podcast app. The best way to support the podcast is to become a Ride IQ member at ride-iq.com. And when you do, we hope you're excited to see that In Stride is just one of multiple podcast shows on the app, including hack chats, conversations with coaches, and more. And lastly, I wanted to let you know that our friends over at Major League Eventing also have a podcast. And if you enjoyed this show, I think you would also really enjoy their show. Just search for the Major League Eventing podcast in your podcast app and give it a listen. 